in this letter of Ephesians, uh, you know, if you've been carrying around your Job journal, then this one must feel a little odd to you because it's so thin. Uh, but we're just keeping in mind, this, it should be a good reminder to us that Ephesians and, and these epistles are truly letters. They're, they're not books of the Bible. They're letters that were put into the canonization of Scripture. Uh, we think of them as books, but really they were started off as letters that were written. This one was let, written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. And as it, just that alone is a good reminder to us of how much encouragement we really need from the persecuted church uh, when, when we're here in a free country worshiping and, and we could maybe go to church on Sundays, maybe not. We could uh, um, uh, say that we're Christian but not really be held accountable to it because no one really cares in the end uh, for the most part. But in these countries where Christians are persecuted regularly, how much it benefits us to be reminded of their constant persecution. That their lives are at stake just for gathering on the Lord's day. Their lives are at stake just for exposing their faith to their family members, of possibly being uh, completely exiled out of their families, out of their households, because they believe in Jesus. And this letter being written by Paul from prison is a good reminder to the Christians in Ephesus, in which this letter is probably meant to be circulated to all the Christians in that area of Asia Minor, uh, modern-day Turkey. If you go to the QR code, there is a map on there I put down there for you. You can see the locations of these historic places, which now is known as, as Turkey. But the Christians in Ephesus would have needed this reminder of Paul's persecution for his faith. That these are people who lived in a very pagan culture, much like we do today, even though our, our founding fathers and our, our country was built upon Christian principles and foundations, uh, this country is very much a pagan culture. Uh, you, you don't need to watch very much TV to know that uh, we, are, we are very much a pagan culture. We are an anti-Christ, anti-God culture. This is a post-Christian society we're living in. And so just like in Ephesus, people were surrounded constantly by things that were not Christ-like. They were surrounded constantly by their former ways of living. The gods they used to worship in Greece. Uh, if they used to be worshipers of, of Artemis, and they had this big temple built for Artemis in Ephesus. Uh, the, the temple that there is a riot in there in, in the book of Acts uh, because of the movement of the gospel. And so these people in Ephesus, these Christians in Ephesus, were constantly surrounded by their former ways of living. And Paul knows how easy it is to fall into your former ways of living when you're trying to live this new life in Christ, but yet you're surrounded by much of the same people much of the same media, much of the same false god worshipers that live in your neighborhoods, much of the same influences at your workplace, and yet here you are trying to live a new life in Christ. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to them this encouragement. In the first half of Ephesians, much of Paul's writings in, in the first half of his letters is, it had a lot to do with it was establishing doctrine. And, and the letter of Ephesians is no different. He's establishing the doctrines of grace. The immeasurable riches of his grace that we that have poured out upon us and what that means when it comes to our behavior. The second half of Ephesians has shifts from doctrines of grace over to your behaviors as Christians. Here is the immeasurable riches of his grace that we've all received as Christians and now we are children of God where before we were children of wrath or our own sin. And then the second half of his letter is all focused here is how you then should be living. A lot of times people are guilty of living as if they're broke when they're really not. And there's been plenty of people that will take advantage of food pantries and free, free lunches and all the other things when they're really well-to-do, uh, but they really just don't want to spend their own money. And so it's very easy for people to go around and get all these areas that are meant for those who, are, who, who do not have those things and maybe cannot afford those things. But there's plenty of people who can afford those things, but they go to all those locations anyways just because it's free. And they're living broke even though they are rich. Sometimes people can starve themselves or be very stingy with their money, so stingy to, where they're, to their own detriment 
Well, they have uh, plenty of money in their bank account to buy what they need, but because they're so stingy, uh, it's to their own detriment they might starve themselves or be malnourished. There's stories uh, from uh, in past news events where, where there's older couples that have been found dead in their homes uh, as if they were malnourished and, and, and maltreated, but really they just lived so uh, 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 stingily, I can't use the other word, frugal, frugally, thank you. They lived so frugally that people were, are left wondering after the fact, why would they be choosing to live in these circumstances when they have a fortune in their bank account? And this is the case for many Christians, that we live spiritually broke when it actually at the same time we're supposed to be spiritually rich. We have this abundance of immeasurable riches of God's grace in this account laid up for us as heirs of the kingdom, as children of God, but yet we're living our lives constantly spiritually broke. What that means and what that looks like is that we have very little joy. We have very little fruit to show of our faith in Christ. We, we have very little to share with others in terms of the joy and the peace that we have in our own hearts and our own lives. And, and when people come across us, it seems like we're so overwhelmed with stress and everything else, it's as if we're spirit, just as spiritually broke as our lost friends and, and neighbors. But yet we're supposed to be children of God, and we're supposed to have these things, these immeasurable riches to share with other people. As Paul writes, we're children of the light, where before we were of the dark. If you read with me in the first passage of, that we have in the QR code, I encourage you to follow along. In Ephesians chapter 2, it starts, of, starts us off saying, You were dead in, your tres in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And by grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. And the word grace is used in there, just in that short section, four times. It's 12 times total in the letter of Ephesians. 11 of those times are before the passage that we're getting started in Ephesians 5. The only, the 12th time it comes is when Paul writes his goodbyes, and it comes right at the very end. So 11 times, the Apostle Paul emphasizes God's grace in our lives. We are recipients of these immeasurable riches of God's grace, and his, ultimately his question is for, for the Ephesians is, why aren't you living like it? Why aren't you living like it? Why are you still living so broke when you have the immeasurable, immeasurable riches to draw upon on a regular basis from God? Ephesians 4 to 6, like I mentioned before, is we're just going to focus on the behaviors of the recipients of God's grace. You know, if, if you're a recipient of God's grace, it's going to show in your behavior, especially in this Christmas season when it's supposed to be all about joy, peace, hope, and love. There's many people who are living their lives without joy, peace, hope, and love. And many of those people are going to be professing Christians. And the question for them would be, why are they living that way? if they profess to be recipients of this grace of God. And Paul's argument is, well, they're simply not walking in the way that they should walk. Right. If they just humble themselves and be obedient to God and be, be obedient to Christ, they wouldn't be walking in darkness. It's not about their circumstances changing. It's not about getting a magical amount of money from the sky that will fix your, your money issues. It's not about someone magically leaving your life so that you have no drama in your life. It's, it's none of those things. 
has everything to do with our own hearts and our own behaviors, how we respond. If we've been paying attention through the series of Job and talk about sufferings, we've been uh, repeatedly talking about how our own sufferings are mostly caused by our own reactions, our own decisions, how we respond to our spouses, how we respond to our children, how we respond in the workplace, how we treat our neighbors, what kind of attitudes are we showing up to on a daily, on a daily basis to our work or with our family or with our neighbors, all those relationships in our lives. Most of our suffering is caused by whether or not we're walking in obedience to Christ. If we're truly honest with ourselves. And those who have received grace will show grace. You know, Jesus gave me an example of this in regards to forgiveness. In Luke chapter 7, a certain moneylender had two debtors, and Jesus is telling us to his listeners, one owed 500 denarii and another 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both of them. Now which of them will love him more? This should be an easy answer, right? Simon answered, well, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward this, this woman who is washing Jesus' feet with her tears, wiping his feet with her hair. And these people were, were accusing Jesus of why would he allow such a woman to touch him in this way? That's why he's sharing this parable. So he says, as he turned to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And the implication there is, if you're only forgiven a little, then you're really not forgiven at all. If you're only forgiven a little, and you appear before God's throne of judgment, then you're only forgiven a little for the whole lot of sin that you committed. So you're not sneaking by in God's graces into the heavenly gates by being forgiven a little. You can't get by with being forgiven a little. Remember, this takes place before Christ died and rose again. He had not yet paid for the sins of the world on the cross. Up to that point, they still had to be obedient to God's law, referring to repentance through offering the proper sacrifices when they sinned. So to be forgiven a little is a very bad thing. You don't want to skate by in your life thinking, well, at least I'm forgiven a little. No, that, that's the same as damnation for your soul. Don't think that being forgiven a little is a good enough thing. And that's what Jesus is implying to the hypocrites, to the Pharisees uh, who, are, who are challenging him in this moment. You want to be forgiven much, like this woman is. And she's forgiven, and she loved much because she understood she was forgiven much. I think the same principle works with grace. It works with grace. We show grace as we've experienced grace. Specifically, the more we understand the doctrines of God's grace, then the more we're going to show God's grace to one another. This is going to come up big time in our letter in Ephesians, because it's going to be all about the local church and gathering for the local church in unity within the local churches. What does it mean to have unity in the local churches? Well, a lot of it has to do with grace. Bearing with one another, showing grace for one another, uh, not being easily offended by one another, being willing to forgive one another, uh, being patient with other people's quirks and, and all uh, how their uh, their idiosyncrasies and their personalities. All those things have to happen in order for a church to be healthy. We can't just count on uh, joining maybe a church that's so big that you don't know anyone and you don't have to be bothered by anyone because you can show up and just be a fly on the wall, leave and no one will know the difference. That's not healthy church membership. And that's not healthy church living, and that's not healthy church attendance. There's nothing wrong with large churches, and there are ways to do large, uh, have large congregations and do it well. And there's way to have smaller congregations and to do it well. But a lot of it has to come down to what Paul is going to be writing about in our text this morning. Laying the foundation of how to build our spiritual homes, it begins with how we behave with one another. 
before we get into the specifics of marriage and parenting and, and all the other stuff, that all the relationships that take place in the household, the Apostle Paul is laying down the foundation by saying, here's how everybody needs to behave regardless of who you are. He's laying down the behaviors, the proper behaviors for walking in the light that applies to every single person in the local church. And then he's going to get into specifics about the various relationship roles in husbands and wives and parents and children. And so let's go to our text, Ephesians chapter 5. Here is the foundation that the Apostle Paul is laying down, verse 15 to 21. And I'm just going to read from our scripture journal here. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with, with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The first phrase here, look carefully then how you walk, not as wise, unwise, but as wise people. And he just finished describing to the Ephesians how they're, they're continually walking in their former ways of living. And he goes on to this list about sexual immorality, impurities, and covetousness, and, and filthiness coming out of our mouths, and all these other things, and how we need to walk as children of light, as it says in verse 8. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. And then he, he quotes this Old Testament passage of, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And that's what leads into verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but wise. Why do we need to look carefully? Because living as recipients of God's riches of grace, it requires careful attention. From the moment you wake up, it's going to require your careful attention of what kind of attitude are you going to use, or are you going to have to face the day. It's going to require special attention when, you know, when children talk back to you, or when you and your spouse have a disagreement, or when your co-workers are, are, or whether they're subordinate to you, or it's your bosses, when they don't react in ways that you would want them to react. It's going to require special attention. It's going to special, require special attention each and every time you get your paycheck. What am I going to do with my money? Am I going to glorify God with this or am I not? It's going to require special attention with what we do with our free time. Is this glorifying God or is it not? It's going to glorify, we have, it requires our special attention when we're in the home, when there's less accountability maybe, than when we're with all of one, with one another in the church setting, when we're away, it's like a coal away from the fire, what are, what is your life like when you're apart from the other coals? It requires special attention. That's what Paul's getting at here. Look carefully then how you walk, because you can easily walk in the darkness. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. And the question is, well, why are the days evil? It's because we're constantly surrounded by it. We're constantly surrounded by evil. It's bad enough that we still sin, but we're also surrounded by sinners. We're surrounded by sinners in the workplace and in the home and everywhere else. And uh, things that we see on the news can frustrate us and, and, and make us angry and, and it can ruin our whole day when we see things in politics or on the news or things that have happened to people. Uh, whether it's here locally or even thousands of miles away, someone's day could be ruined just by what they see on TV. And this requires special attention. We're surrounded by evil. We're surrounded by the temptation to do evil. And so it's walk carefully, not as unwise, but as wise. We need to make the best use of our time because the days are evil. We're constantly surrounded by it. If we're not careful, we're constantly surrounded by, uh, by evil uh, influences. What we see on television, the vast number of motivational speakers 
that make a lot of money by just motivating people to be all they can be and believe themselves. And they can do it if they really believe it, if they really think hard enough on it, if they just try hard enough, they can do all the things they dream of. Now, are those inherently bad things? No. But we have to be careful. There is, there is an assumed morality in motivational speaking. There is an assumed morality in motivational speaking. We're assuming when we tell people to be all that you want to be, we're assuming that they, what they want to be is something good. A criminal works very hard at being a criminal. Amen. The best drug, the best drug dealers in the world, they work very hard at drug dealing. That is true. They don't sleep. They work very hard at it. They're very successful at it. You know what? They might have benefited from a motivational speaker that told them they just need to set their priority to what's important to them, and they guess what? They can they can gain the whole world out of it. And maybe some drug dealer listened to some motivational speaker say, "I could be all I can be. I'm really gonna put all my all into this and be the best drug dealer in the entire world." And guess what? They're living richly. They're not sleeping much, I'm sure. But there is an assumed morality in motivational speaking. That's the difference between hearing a sermon from scripture and hearing a speech that you like on YouTube or anywhere else that just makes you feel better at the end of the day. Because you're assuming that you have your moral compass aligned with their own moral compass. So we have to be very careful as the days are evil that any word that we receive that we would find beneficial in our lives, it has to come from scripture. There's social media, there's politics, our own sin nature. And as we, what we've been learning from the book of Job, maybe it's your professing Christian friends that really just aren't giving you very biblical advice. <laughs> that we have to be, be, be careful of. That happens all the time. Christian friends who do not give biblical or sound advice. We are surrounded by evil. We have to be careful. We have to walk carefully. Because the darkness is just one decision away. The, the amount of suffering maybe you're, you're experiencing in your marriages or in your families or in your homes or in your, in your most, in your closest relationships, a lot of those things are decided on one bad decision. How you responded to somebody, how you were misinterpreted, or how you were misunderstood, and how maybe even the smallest things blow up into huge things, all because of a simple misunderstanding. And once again, Paul is writing, you are to walk carefully. Look carefully how you walk, because the darkness is just one decision away. It's just one decision away. Ephesians 5, 17, he goes on to say, Therefore, because we're surrounded by evil, because we have to walk very carefully around the darkness and navigate our way very carefully around, this darkness can very easily consume our lives, that robs us of the joy, peace, and love, and hope that we should have in Christ. He says, therefore, don't be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. There is a way to know what exactly what God wants for you. And it starts with knowing his word. Time and time again, I'll hear from people saying, well, I'm just waiting on a word from the Lord. God won't tell me what to do. I know he'll tell me what to do. Well, they're not reading his word. They're not talking to Christian friends. They're not praying about the word. They might be praying, but they're not allowing the word of God to direct their prayers. It's more like God just telling me what to do if they think it's, they're going to have a special revelation. But many times people will just say, God will tell me what to do. But yet they fail to go to his word. They want a special revelation just for them that applies just to them. And conveniently, they can't be held accountable to it because guess what? They received a special revelation from God that no one else got. So no one can hold them accountable because they can easily say, well, this is what God told me to do. Oh, where is it in the Word? And 99.9% .9 of the times, of course, I'm using that facetiously, it's going to be in here. You want to know what God wants to do in relationships? Easy. Reconcile. Do you want to do that? No. But God's word, or you don't have to go very far to know what God says, what to do in your most difficult relationships. You don't need to look very far to know what God wants you to do when you're struggling in sin. We can know exactly what the will of the Lord is. 
Paul is saying, don't be foolish. Understand what God wants for you. And he goes right into it. He, then he goes into, uh, right into telling us exactly what, what it is that the Lord wants for us. Well, Ephesians 5.18 says, don't get drunk with wine, but as debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And with the fact that it says the Spirit, this isn't just be Spirit-filled in any sense. Is you're being filled with the Spirit of God. Now, why is he comparing this with what it means to be drunk with wine? Well, because if you're drunk with wine, you're literally giving in to all your uh, natural desires. You're lowering all your in inhibitions where there's no, any, there's no restraint to how you would normally behave unrestrainedly, right? There's the various kinds of drunk people. There's the happy drunk, the angry drunk, the sad drunk. But what that really means is that their inhibitions have been lowered to where that's kind of their default personality goes. It was just it is inhibited to where there's no restraint. They're angry, well, good luck restraining an angry drunk. They're a happy drunk, good luck restraining a happy drunk. They're a sad drunk, good luck encouraging a, a sad drunk. Because there's no inhibitions. There's no longer any restraint in their life. They're literally bowing to the drink. And the reason why I believe the Apostle Paul is, is contrasting this with what it means to be filled with the Spirit, because when we are walking in the light, we're literally bowing to the will of the Spirit. You're not walking in your darkness anymore. When you're walking in the light, it means that you're literally bowing to what the Lord wants for you. You're not bowing to the drink like a drunk would bow to the drink. When a drunk gets drunk, they do whatever the drink tells them to. Right? Isn't that what makes drunk driving so dangerous? Because they have no control over their driving at that point. There is no restraint against the drink. When it comes to bowing to the Spirit, we should be bound to the Spirit in a very similar way as a drunk would to a drink. You're obeying the Spirit. You're not, you're not restraining yourself in obedience to God anymore. You're, you're walking in the light because the, the Spirit is literally filling you up. And you're drunk with the Spirit to where you're bowing to the will of of the Spirit. You're lowering all those restraints of, but God, I don't want to forgive them. But God, I don't want to clean up my language. God, I don't want to give up this music in the movies that I enjoy watching all the time. God, I, I really don't like my neighbor, and I don't want to like my neighbor. It could be all those things that we are restraining ourselves from being obedient to Christ. And to be drunk with the Spirit literally means we're letting go of that restraint. You're bowing your obedience to the Spirit like a drunk person would to a drink. You're filled with the Spirit. You're drunk with the Spirit. You're no longer resisting the will of God in your life because that's what's causing the darkness in your life in the first place. You're resisting the Spirit. And Paul goes into specifics about this. All Christians are spirit-filled, by the way. Every Christian has the fullness of the Spirit of God in them. There's no second filling of the Spirit that you need as a Christian. Uh, when we say spirit-filled living, uh, this isn't to say that we go around and, and, and work miracles all over, the, all over the place. It doesn't mean that we're just uh, bursting out and spontaneously and, and, and uh, wondrous tongues and all these other things and strange languages. That's not what spirit-filled living means. In this text, what spirit-filled living means is that you're living obediently to Christ. Right. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Remember, that the, the illustration of how a drunk obeys the drink, that's what it means to be spirit-filled. You can see someone drunk with the Spirit of God, not because they're speaking in tongues or because they're, they're healing people left and right. It was, you can see someone who's drunk with the Spirit because they are supernaturally forgiving. They're supernaturally gracious and kind to those who most people are not very kind to. They're supernaturally patient with those who most people aren't very patient with at work. They're supernaturally uh, understanding and, and to other people who are easily misunderstood by everyone else. That's what it means to be drunk with the Spirit. People notice that you're behaving differently because you're under the influence of the Spirit. And they might not know that, those who are not Christians, you're not going to say, oh, that person 
is really obey the Spirit of God. No, they're going to think that person is very strange. Why are they so mean to this person when I would be yelling at that person easily? The cashier, the poor cashiers during Christmas time or Black Friday sales, right? Uh, you can witness the ungodliness and how human beings treat one another just during the holiday shopping. But what does it look like for us as members of First Baptist Church to go out and be seen as people who are drunk with the Spirit? Are we letting people in line before us? Are we letting people get the gifts if it's the last one on the shelf? And realize it's okay if someone else gets the last one. There's so many easy applications to this. But Paul is writing, understand what the Lord is. Number one, be spirit-filled. Live spirit-filled. Live as if you were drunk, who is obeying the drink. Obey the spirit as a drunk would obey the drink. That's the laying the foundation right there for knowing what the Lord of the will is. In Ephesians, he gives us, just staying in this letter of Ephesians, we have plenty of ammunition right here uh, to reinforce this. Now, Paul gives us a clear list in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. He's saying, do not lie or sin in your anger. Don't steal or be lazy. Uh, don't use corrupt talk. Uh, don't reserve any bitterness or wrath in you or slander or malice. Uh, stop committing sexual immorality. Stop with the filthy and foolish talk or crude joking that is not edifying anybody. Stop coveting what each other has. Well, there's another holiday passage right there. Stop coveting what other people are buying for Christmas or getting for Christmas, right? Stop thinking that somehow God has done you some sort of injustice because your Christmas gifts aren't as nice as someone else's Christmas gifts. That's what coveting means. It's not a sin to desire what is good. It, it's a sin to desire other things as if God has done you some sort of injustice. And then somehow bless someone else that has somehow mistreated you because you don't have what someone else has. Those are all the do nots that the Apostle Paul has. Here are the do's. Speak edifying words that give grace. So, okay, so as the abundant, as the recipients of immeasurable riches of God's grace, well, Paul says, speak words that give grace. You've received grace, now give it back to somebody, or give it to someone, pay it forward. Give grace with your words. <laughs> Labor in such a way that you're able to share with others what God has blessed you with. You know, in the final part of our passage, verses 19 to 21, now that Paul's laid down the foundation of being spirit-filled and what that means, he's going to give us three main traits of what spirit-filled living looks like. Number one is faithfulness in gathering together. He says in verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now this is much more about just singing praise songs to God. This is also uh, another connection to the importance of physically gathering as a local church. The importance of physically gathering as a local church, that w which many people have be become confused about with, with COVID and what that did to a lot of people's understandings of what the church is. Uh, people thinking that, well, I'm a part of a church because I watch on it. I watch their services every Sunday. Well, if you watch a service of a church that's thousands of miles away every Sunday, that's great for some level of edification for you because you're receiving teachings from the Word of God, hopefully from a proper teacher, but you're by no means part of that local church. If you're going to show up and ask for financial assistance or, or you're, you show up and you ask for help or uh, you show up and you expect to know people there, no one's going to know you. They can't see what's on the other side of the camera. The local church gathering is essential to proper Christian living. One of the reasons is right here. How can we address or speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with our hearts? How can we do that effectively if we don't faithfully gather together? Prisoners, Christian prisoners in other countries are singing together in prisons. Because once again, we can receive encouragement from those who are being persecuted. They are still singing because they are singing because of their persecution, and they're singing unashamedly in those prisons, 
even under their circumstances. And yet Christians in America struggle to sing worship songs because it's not contemporary enough, or it doesn't have drums, or it doesn't have a guitar, or it doesn't have a piano. Maybe their favorite singer is not singing it. Maybe it's not their favorite key to sing in. And they'll just say, well, I don't really like this song. I'm not going to sing it. But yet Christians in other countries, they will gladly sing in any key with no instruments because they understand the importance of their faith, getting them through the time that they're getting through. When we sing together on Sunday mornings, what we're after, what we talk about weekly as a staff and, and, and monthly as a leadership, is a concept of congregational singing. Our aim for our music and our worship services is not to play over the top of the congregation, not to give you some kind of a show for you to say, oh wow, they're really good, uh, they're really good at this song. No, the goal of the music coming from the stage, from this platform, is to encourage congregational involvement so that we can do exactly what Ephesians 5 is saying here. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That's why it's appropriate for us to be standing together in worship. We're standing together in worship, and as a way of affirming one another, we are all in agreement with the words that are being sung, and you are my vision, God. Or come, all ye faithful. Or forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. We're singing those songs with one another, in the presence of one another, with one audience, which is God. We're all singing to God together with one another, and we're singing in agreement with each other. That's the importance of congregational singing. Because if we're singing songs on the platform that the congregation can't sing along with us in agreement, then we have no business doing that song. This is a much more about this is about much more than just singing. It's actually more about gathering together. Why is the physical presence of church members essential to having a spirit-filled lifestyle? But here are just a few things. Number one, and this is no particular order, but number one, it helps us resist the sin of favoritism. The sin of favoritism. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Who's preaching that day? Who's going to be at church this day? Uh, how long is the service going to be on this day? Are they going to sing the songs that I like? Are the musicians that I like going to be on stage that day? Uh, are my friends going to be at church on that day? Is my wife going to be, or my wife or husband going to be at home on that on that Sunday? Uh, by by faith by the faithful gathering together as believers, as members of a local church. And this, and this is applying to every single local church. By faithfully gathering together, it helps us avoid the sin of favoritism. James, too, speaks very strongly against this. These are Jewish Christians who they are touting their Jewishness. And, and Jesus' half-brother, James, wrote a letter to them, to all the Jews dispersed abroad. He wrote a letter to them because they were playing favoritism. And they were self-righteous. They were saying, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Later on, he goes to say, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show any partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as a sinner. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of breaking the all of it. And the example he used was their treatment that they showed to those who were rich. He showed that they would show them great treatment, give them the, the best seats in the house, the best seats in, in their gatherings. And the poor people were literally sitting on the floor or in someone's footstool. For us, what does that look like? What does it look like for you? It looks differently for all of us. The sin of favoritism. But by faithfully gathering with one another, it helps us avoid committing the sin of favoritism. 
It helps us confront the favoritism in our hearts when we show up and maybe there's someone uh, that, uh, that has offended you recently or someone uh, that you offended them recently or there might be tension that exists by you just by showing up, you're making it possible to reconcile. By not gathering with the local church, you're making it impossible for reconciliation. And once again, for those that might say, well, I'm just waiting for God to tell me what to do in this situation. Uh, God tells us very clearly what to do. When someone sins against you, you forgive them. When you sin against someone else, you repent. And you reconcile. Because as 1 Corinthians says, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. If you've received reconciliation, how are you portraying that in your life? Just by faithfully gathering together on the Lord's day, we're helping one another avoid the sin of favoritism. Another reason why it's important to gather faithfully as being spirit-filled Christians is without it, we can't completely obey Christ's commands. How are we to submit to, uh, to the church's teachings or to the leadership of the church? As it says in Hebrews 13, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Well, how can church leaders watch over the souls of their members if, they don't even, if they're not even physically present? And that is one of the greatest burdens of anyone in ministry leadership is this responsibility we have to watch over the souls of of those in the local churches, but then they feel almost like it's impossible to, to establish any kind of communication. And it's burdening for not just me, but other elders in many other churches. It, it is a burden, because at some point, it is, am I doing enough? Is there something more I could be doing to where these people, would, these lovely members of the local churches would somehow respond uh, to our efforts of reaching out to them. It's a burden. Because myself and many other elders and many other churches, this is something that we take very seriously. Caring for the souls of those who are under the spiritual care of the local church. If we don't gather together, how are we supposed to uh, lovingly discipline one another? As it says in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Between you and him alone, that involves gathering together. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you, more gathering together, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, the gathered church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. It makes it very difficult to care for one another spiritually if they're not physically present, if they're not physically available. And this isn't to speak to those who are unable to physically be present, right? There's people who are struggling with health, uh, injuries, surgeries, recovering from procedures. Uh, of course, those are exceptions to the idea of gathering together. But what I'm focusing on is the refusal to gather together. The refusal of prioritizing the gathering of the local church on the Lord's Day. And we, we refuse to gather for many, many reasons. It's the only day we have off. It's uh, maybe um, uh, we don't like wake up in the mornings, uh, football games or sports events. Uh, uh, we simply don't want to, maybe, is another idea. Uh, maybe there's tension in relationships within the church body that by showing up, it's just you can't face the awkwardness uh, uh, face head on or face on, and so it's either to just avoid the whole situation altogether. There's many ways that we simply refuse to gather on Sundays. Even though that's a strong word to use, it, it really is the truth. We refuse to gather for a number of reasons. But with that, we can't look properly love one another, especially when we fall into sin. Effectively caring for widows and the elders of local church, it says in 1 Timothy 5, he goes over instructions on what it means to care for the people on both ends of the church, those who are in very much of a need and those who are laboring on behalf of the congregation. Uh, 1 Timothy 5 goes into what it looks like for the gathered church, for the gathered local church, to properly care for widows. How do we work together to care for those who are in need in our congregation? 
to meet one another's physical needs. We can't do that properly without faithfully gathering together, without being physically present. All the one another's in the New Testament scriptures, there's one another, uh, some people call it one another -ing. It's all these one another, forgive one another, love one another, bear with one another, uh, forgive one another, share with one another. Uh, all these one another's laid out in scripture, they, we can't possibly say we're spirit-filled Christians if we are not gathering together because it would make it impossible for us to be obedient to all those one another's in scripture. Greet, uh, gathering with one another, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, Paul's writing about the unity of the local church, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, then all suffer together. If one member is honored, then all rejoice together. That wouldn't be possible without the gathering and the physical presence of the gathered local church. To truly bear one another's burdens that they're struggling with, their prayer requests, their, their, their health issues, their uh, the things that are stressing them out, their, their, their holidays, or, or maybe the loneliness in their life, or their anxieties, depression. How can we effectively bear those things with one another if we don't gather with one another? Faithfully. Bearing with and forgiving one another. There's another important one, Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 and 16. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, you forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Another important aspect of gathering together is confessing our sins to one another. In James 5.16 it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be spiritually healed. We need that accountability in our lives. We need each other to expose our spiritual blind spots. Remember, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 7, about how we need someone else to take the speck out of our eye. If you're trying to take uh, the speck out of your brother's eye, be able to log in your own eye, then you can't do it effectively. But the implication there is that we are expected to be looking for the specks in each other's eyes so we can help each other out. You can't do that without the faithful gathering of the local church. To establish trusting relationships with one another, uh, people that you grow to love and understand, and the people that maybe you thought were uh, were annoying at first, now they're not so annoying. Now you got to know them because they got to know how annoying you are, right? <laughs> because they got to know you better. And maybe that didn't occur to us right away. Maybe maybe I'm the annoying one. I, I've been that person personally many times. Where it was my tendencies, it was my idiosyncrasies, my habits that would really get on other people's nerves, and I had to humble myself in those situations. But how often we think that everyone else is the annoying one, but not us. Have we ever thought about how patient people are, are being with us? Have we ever considered how much grace other people are showing towards us when we were misunderstood, or we said something that didn't sound right when it came out of our mouths, we didn't mean it that way, but it was understood that way? Are we really being mindful of how much grace is being shown towards us just by our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? I think if it was truly exposed, there's somehow some sort of special like meter that we could see of how much grace has been shown to us. It's something that's concrete that we could actually see uh, physically with our own eyes. I think it would help us out a lot in how much grace we are to show for other people. Because we would see this, this cylinder constantly filled with grace of how much people have shown us and how much of that we can just pour into other people's lives. But we don't have that special meter. So we have to kind of humble ourselves the best we can under the Spirit of God and, and ask for His help. But once again, that's, that help comes through the gathering of the local church. How do we receive that help in being humble and being aware of our spiritual blind spots? We allow other people to get to know us. 
and for us to get to know them. And ultimately, gathering together is how we practically exercise Christ's love. You know, for Christians who want to be Christians without the gathering of the local church, you know, they say, well, I can be a Christian, but I don't, I don't have to go to church. Well, that's true. You could be a Christian, and you might never go to church. Maybe you become a Christian at the last moment of your life, and you've never been to church before. But you put your faith in Christ, and you inherit all the same blessings eternally that we've all inherited, even though we've been Christians for 30, 40 years. That's, a, that's the immeasurable riches of God's grace. But for someone to say, to, to willingly live their life rebelling against the gathering of the local church, they can easily pick and choose who they hang, hang out with. They can easily pick and choose those who are convenient for them at the time. They can easily, conveniently choose uh, to hang out with other Christian friends that they know aren't going to try to uh, uh, convict them of things that the other Christians have tried to convict them of, right? If, they, if a Christian... Um, um, if someone in the local church is being convicted by the, the kinds of TV shows and movies that they watch, and, and they don't really like it, they say, well, you know, I don't really see anything wrong with watching all these, all these uh, uh, nude scenes and sex scenes in the movies. It doesn't bother me. Well, you know, I, I'm going to make some new Christian friends that don't give me a hard time about that. And then they leave the gathering of the local church to find convenient Christian friends or professing Christian friends that they know aren't going to convict them on anything. In other way, Christians who refuse to gather with the local church, many times they just choose to hang out with unbelievers. And the unbelievers will never be any wiser as to, well, is their Christian friend really living as a Christian? They'll just assume yes. And those non-Christian friends, non friends will say things like, Oh, that's cool. I didn't know Christians could do that. And the Christian guy might say, oh, yeah, we could do that. Of course, we can watch what we want. We can drink what we want. We can do what we want. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I'm just like you guys. I'm just a Christian. And their non-Christian friends aren't going to hold them accountable. And it's very easy to do. Because in that Christian friend's mind, they're thinking, I'm spreading the love of Christ to these unbelievers. They get to see me, and I'm just like them. I'm just a Christian. I can do all the things they do, say, I can talk like how they talk, I can, I can participate in all the activities they do, I can do all that stuff, I'm just a Christian, and I'm spreading the love of Jesus to them. And those, those poor unbelievers will be deceived into thinking that that's a proper Christian example for them to see. It's all because that one Christian who decided, I don't need to gather at the local church, they're now calling their own shots. And no one is holding them accountable. And I would argue to say not even God is holding them accountable because they're rejecting God's commands all over the place, left or right. But God will hold them accountable at the end. This is the importance of gathering faithfully as a local church. Rid all favoritism from our hearts. We encourage one another just by being there. You need prayer? You would hope that when you show up, there's someone to pray with you. Not that everyone decided, oh, you know, this Sunday is a really busy Sunday for us. Let's just not show up. And little did you know, it's someone that showed up to be prayed for. I, you know, you, each and every member in this church has a special relationship that's more unique and more special than I will ever have with other people. Because I can't have every single relationship uh, and make every single priority in every relationship uh, and, and do it effectively. God has provided us, one another, as many parts of one body to where you're going to be able to pray for someone and minister to someone in this local church, in the body of this church, in a way that I never could. Because of your personality. Because of your uniqueness and your relationship with them. Because of how you might be able to relate to that person where I can't relate to them. By not gathering faithfully, we are robbing one another of those, of those unique uh, uh, those unique aspects in every friendship that we have. Sometimes it's those smallest things that you have something in common with someone that launch into a, a flourishing, healthy relationship. It could be that you have a birthday on the same day, or you like the same hobbies, 
or, or that you, uh, you're born in the same state or the same city or went to the same school as a kid. It could be something small like that. Or it could be that you both went through uh, 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 a miscarriage. Or you both went through a certain tragedy. You both lost your mothers or fathers at a young age. You both went through a divorce, and now you're helping each other uh, pick up the pieces that happens. There are so many unique aspects that God has put in our lives to use for his glory. If we don't faithfully gather together, we're robbing each other of all those things that God uses to help us live in the light and live as spirit-filled Christians. All those things I just mentioned, how easy it is for all those forms of suffering to cause us to continue to walk in darkness. All the previous tragedies, all the previous hurts and pains, uh, all the f struggles that we've been through, how easy would it be for those things to cause us to walk in darkness? As Paul writes, you're to walk carefully. What's so special about hymn songs and spiritual songs? The most important thing about this aspect of singing these things together is that we're singing about God to God in agreement with God's children. We're singing to God, about God, in agreement with God's children. Johann Sebastian Bach, of course, composed over a thousand songs, compositions. A Lutheran, faithful Lutheran music minister. It is said that over 75% of his compositions were written for specifically for local church worship. Over 75%, a thousand plus of his compositions were written for the purpose of being used in the local church. For local churches to worship God, about God, sing to God, and agree with God's children. Singing God's praises should become a natural desire for God's children. Uh, we know this all too well in just their basic humanity. It is not very hard to get people to sing in times of celebration. When people win the championship and their favorite team is winning, they sing, we are the champion, my friend, right? They just burst out in their favorite song. It all takes one person to get started. And they sing songs of praise and celebration, all because a, a sports team won a game. Two-hour event. People sing at weddings and and they dance at weddings because they're celebrating. Uh, people who normally don't sing in front of people would gladly sing, sing at a wedding if it means something to their loved ones, right? Oh, I'm only doing this for you. And they start singing. Uh, the, the groom will take dance lessons. They'll take singing lessons or uh, something along those lines. But we are well accustomed to people in all cultures naturally breaking out into song in times of celebration. Now, why is it so hard? Or so strange, we go to churches, but people don't sing. Do they have anything to celebrate? Are they being careful in how they walk in the light? Do they understand the importance of what it means to, to draw upon these immeasurable riches that have been poured out upon us? We have this, this account that we have unlimited access to, and the imme immeasurable riches of God, and yet we're not accessing it. But we will gladly sing songs in the bars. We'll gladly sing patriotic songs when it comes to uh, patriotic times in our country. We'll sing all those songs. But then when it comes to worship in the local church, specifically how many men I've heard say, well, I'm not a singer. No, I don't sing. Well, if I sung, it would hurt God's ears. If I sung, people would be mad at me. I'd just throw everybody off. That's baloney. <laughs> That's a poor excuse not to sing. If you have something to celebrate in Christ, it is a natural desire to want to sing his praises okay. with his people about the one who saved you to the one who saved you. It's a natural desire for spirit-filled Christians. Finally, in the last two verses, Ephesians 5, 20, it says to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence, or another word you could use there is out of fear for Christ. 
Spirit-filled living is characterized primarily by a fear and reverence to obey Christ as our head. It's not you, you, you fear Christ and somehow that he's not going to be pleased with you and then he's going to punish you all of a sudden. No, it's this fear of Christ that you've, if you've received these immeasurable riches, you understand this reverence for Christ as being a great high priest who is passed through the heavens, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4. He is passed through the heavens for us and he is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, right. mediating for us. Right. And so that deserves great reverence for Christ and our fear for Christ because we fear uh, of grieving his spirit. We, would, we should fear hurting the one that we claim to love the most. As a young man would fear if he was at the door of sin and he was about to open that door of sin and he has a sudden thought that comes to his mind, what would my mother think if I opened this door? And that thought alone would stop him. Or maybe for some of us, it'd be, what would my father think if I opened this door? <laughs> and what would my father do if I opened this door? But, but that gentleness of a mother's spirit, that hurting the sweet mother, our, our sweet motherly characters in our lives, of a young man thinking, what would this do to my mother if I opened this door of sin? How that would hurt her. This mother who has cared for me all my life and brought me up and, and nursed me and all these other things, what would, this, what would opening this door do to my relationship with my mother? That's the same attitude we should have towards God, towards Christ. This, this uh, reverence of fear for Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 10 says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. We give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that, that term, submitting to one another, one another, is coming right before Paul is about to go into the relationships that are going to involve submission and authority. Proper use of submission, proper use of authority. In, in the husband-wife relationship, in the parent-child relationship, in the master-slave relationship, in all the relationships that they had in their households at that time, <coughs> Paul is about to go over proper submission and proper authority. But before he even goes into the specifics of those relationships, he's saying you are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's for Christ alone that we are going, that should motivate us to submit to him, be spirit-filled Christians and spirit-filled living. Remember, spirit-filled living means that we're living in obedience to Christ, and that alone is what's going to help us to fulfill our roles in our households. If we just try to fulfill the roles in our household to just think that we'll have an easier life at home, but yet we're really not submitting to Christ, it's not going to work. The foundation that's being laid here for how to build your home, how to build your spiritual home, is, is to submit and be reverence towards, have reverence towards Christ first and foremost. And when you do that, then the relationships in your home are going to all come together. As everybody submits to Christ. We're all in agreement in our, in our household of saying, we will all submit to Christ. When we all do that, I don't have to worry about telling everyone else what to do or worry about what everyone's not doing. Because we are all submitting to Christ. Christ will convict them as Christ will convict me. I don't have to worry about managing every, everyone's uh, uh, separate individual responsibilities in the homes because they're submitting to Christ just as I am. I don't need to micromanage. And that's the kind of attitude we should have with one another. By gathering together as a local church, we are here to encourage one another. As we are all submitting to Christ, we can be confident God is going to convict us all at our own time. The important thing, are we being there for each other? Are we showing up to support one another in those times? Because if we're not there, then how will we know? So this is the foundation for spirit-filled living. It's overall submission to Christ, first and foremost. Let's close the prayer. God, we thank you 
for the immeasurable riches of your grace that have been poured out upon us. God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that has not yet experienced that, God, I pray that you would open their hearts in this moment. Experience forgiveness by your grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, that, that you sent Jesus, whose birth we're going to celebrate in just a few weeks. That we get to celebrate the Lord's birth on the Lord's day. What a beautiful thing. The purpose of that child being born to us is eventually he will be sacrificed as the Lamb of God. And that sounds so grim and gruesome to those who do not understand. But for those who do not have ears or the eyes to see and to understand these things, God, it sounds like such a gruesome plan. And it is a gruesome plan, but it's a necessary plan for our forgiveness. God, we, we see the cross and we see the immeasurable riches of your grace poured out in the form of blood on that cross. Poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many people who just put their trust in the resurrected Jesus. This Jesus who was born, he was killed, he was crucified, and he was risen on the third day. He is right now at the, at the right hand of the Father. God, we celebrate a resurrected Lord, a resurrected Jesus. We celebrate that. We sing about it. Not just in the walls of the church. We sing about it in our homes. We sing about it uh, when we rise up and we lay down. We sing about it in our cars. We have no excuse to not sing about it. You God, I pray for anyone in this room who does not yet have that peace and that hope in Christ. God, that you would open their eyes and open their minds to it right now. Fill them with the joy of the Lord. Give them access to the immeasurable riches of your grace that give us the love, the joy, the peace, the hope that, that everybody wants to experience, especially during the holiday seasons. But we know that it's only attained through Christ. God, help us as believers, as Christians who profess the name of Jesus. Help us to live these spirit-filled lives Help us to live as spiritual drunks that bow to your spirit as a drunk bows to the drink. God, I pray that you, would, that you would help us to release any restraint in our hands, in our hearts, in our minds that are holding on to our old ways, that are causing us to live in continual darkness. God, help us to release those grips and give fully into the submission of your spirit's leading us. Help us to walk carefully in the light. Help us to be spirit-filled Christians. Lord, we thank you for giving us this time to sing to you with one another. Sing about you and your goodness. Especially as we sing this last song. God, we thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.